go. So now we're moving on to the systems that basically um, move everything around and provide the body with uh, necessary molecules um, like oxygen and in this case, everything else that circulates in the blood. So we're going to start this by looking at the heart and then on Wednesday we'll talk about blood vessels and the blood that circulates through the heart and blood vessels and um, kind of put it all together as a single system. Um, I did not mean to leave that in there, but that's fine. Um, this is just uh, your reminder that uh, cardiac muscle uses sarcomeres too. Um, and this was a really cool picture I found of a heart, um, and I keep it in the lecture so that I don't lose it in case it's ever useful. So we're going to start with heart anatomy and uh, move on from there. Um, the heart is, uh, of course, an internal organ in the thoracic cavity. Um, it sits in between the lungs um, in what's called the mediastinum. Um, don't mind the cat sneezing. And uh, all the blood vessels running in and out kind of come in uh, at the top of the superior aspect. Um, the heart is contained within a space called the pericardial cavity. And uh, we're going to explore the different aspects of that as we go through this anatomy. So the heart itself is a four chambered pump. And its job is literally to just deliver blood to the body, making use of blood vessels as its, um, as its highways. Um, it's actually two separate pumps that each have a receiving chamber and a pumping chamber. So the right side of the heart um, is what's called the pulmonary circuit. Its job is to pump blood into the lungs to get oxygen and then um, back to the heart to enter the left side, which is the systemic circuit. The systemic circuit pumps oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body and then um, delivers it uh, back to the heart after it, um, after it does give that oxygen and other nutrients up. So if we look at it, um, we typically draw the um, right side of the heart in blue because um, we, we typically represent uh, deoxygenated blood as blue, although we'll talk about in a second why that's not actually the case. So uh, this is the right atrium, right ventricle over here. And then we um, have the left side of the heart all in red because it's carrying oxygenated blood, which is a brighter red. And so these are the chambers. And as you'll see on this, there's arrows um, showing you the flow of blood. And as you learn this anatomy and you learn um, the circuits and stuff, um, I do recommend that you do it in order, uh, and I will teach all of this stuff to you guys in order because it makes it easier to remember the, um, the, the path that blood takes. So before we get into that detail though, uh, we want to look at the outside and work our way in the way we did with the um, nervous system. So the um, heart has a protective uh, layer surrounding it just like the brain and spinal cord does. Um, in this case, it's a double layered serous and fibrous membrane called the pericardium. Um, so the pericardium is around the pericardial cavity that the heart sits in. Um, there's an outer fibrous layer called the fibrous pericardium, and it's got some dense irregular connective tissue that uh, protects the heart um, it attaches it to its surrounding structures, and it also limits how much the heart can expand, um, because if it expanded too much, that would actually be a bad thing. Inside of the fibrous pericardium is the serous pericardium. The serous pericardium is actually a double-layered serous membrane. So a serous membrane is one that's very thin. Um, it just has a layer of uh, simple squamous epithelium, and Oh, excuse me, Lucy. 
<clears throat> sorry about that, <clears throat> with a space um, filled with a little bit of fluid in between. So part of it is attached to the outside of the heart and we call it the visceral layer of the pericardium. Um, visceral refers to uh, organs, remember? We kind of touched on that, um, visceral and autonomic. So um, it's attached to the outside of the organ and then the parietal layer is attached to the inside of the fibrous pericardium. Fib uh, parietal refers to walls, so the wall of this protective pericardium. So it kind of works like this as far as the serous part. If you picture the, um, the serous pericardium as a balloon with a little bit of fluid in it, and the heart is like this fist that goes into it, now, that you've kind of punched the balloon, part of the wall of the balloon is, a, is touching the fist. That's the um, visceral pericardium. And then um, the rest of the wall is on the other side of the fluid filled space. And that's the uh, parietal pericardium that is then attached to the inside. No, oh, I'm so sorry of um, the fibrous pericardium. Um, in between is the pericardial cavity filled with a little bit of serous fluid, which the um, simple squamous epithelium is actually secreting. And this is exactly how it is with the heart too. So there's a little fold at the top and it is all the way around where this is kind of anchored in. So when we look at the heart itself, we see that it is a three-layered structure that is obviously quite hollow inside. Um, and if we look at the very outside layer, it's actually the visceral pericardium. So it has three different names for the exact same layer of tissue. It's called the epicardium as the layer um, of the outside of the heart. It's also called the mesothelium. Um, although other things are called that as well. And then we also talked about it already as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, um, secreting serous pericardial fluid. Um, so all of those things are the same. Um, now, it being called mesothelium, it shares that with the visceral layer around uh, the lungs, which we'll talk about um, in not too long. And so um, if you've heard about asbestos exposure, putting you at risk for um, mesothelioma. This is the type of tissue that actually becomes cancerous after exposure to asbestos, although it's more the, the lung one. So anyway, that's the epicardium. So the epicardium and the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, same exact tissue. Underneath it, the majority of the heart is the myocardium. So this is the cardiac muscle. Um, it is uh, kind of organized along a fibrous connective tissue framework, so a collagenous framework. Um, and there are blood vessels in there too, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then lining the inside of the heart is the endocardium. Um, it's also called an endothelium. Um, and this is also a simple squamous little membrane. And it happens to be continuous with the lining of the blood vessels. So the blood vessels also have an endothelial um, simple squamous. And in the heart, it just happens to be called the endocardium because it's lining the inside of the heart. So if we look at all of that as layers, if this is the inside of the heart, so the lumen, the endocardium is just this thin little layer. The myocardium or uh, cardiac muscle makes up the majority of the wall of the heart. And then we have the epicardium or visceral layer of the serous pericardium, pericardial cavity with a little bit of pericardial fluid, parietal layer of the serous pericardium, and then the fibrous pericardium on the outside. All right. So all of that contained within the pericardial cavity. Uh, this is showing you how the muscle of the myocardium is oriented. So it's very much wrapping around each chamber so that when it contracts, it's squeezing the contents of the chambers. 
So you can see that we've got it wrapped here and then it kind of does this little figure eighty thing down there. Um, it's never going to contract all the way and we'll talk about why later. Um, but this is just showing you the relaxed ventricles versus the contracted ventricles. Um, okay, so these will be good to refer back to as we go through the, um, the uh, physiology and we look at the blood flow and stuff uh, to help you understand um, the anatomy. Um, you won't have to know all of these things, just the ones that we talk about. Um, this is the uh, posterior view. That was the anterior view. This is the one we typically look at, but um, these are both perfectly valid views of the outside of the heart. Um, this is uh, the view of the inside of the heart, showing you the inside of the chambers as well as other features. Again, good to refer back to, um, but we'll be going over the important parts that you need to know. So, the other big um, anatomical feature of the heart is the valves. Uh, now, valves typically are to ensure the, the direction of flow of a fluid or, or a gas, but in this case, a fluid. Um, and so, in this case, the blood only gets to go one direction as it, as it travels through the heart. It, it should always go one way, never the other way. And in order to make sure that that happens, there are valves between the chambers. So the blood flow is always from the atria to the ventricles. So the atria are the receiving chambers at the top. They receive blood and then they go through a valve into the ventricle and then they leave the heart. And then the other side is also going to receive blood, go through the valve, into the ventricle, and then out of the heart. So as we'll talk about, the valves open or close in response to pressure changes, um, and they again ensure this one-way flow. I think I thought I had another slide with words on it. Sorry, don't, don't mind that. Um, so here are all the valves. So the valves are actually all sitting in between the uh, atria and the ventricles, so the upper chambers and the lower chambers. And they're all attached to a fibrous uh, skeleton of the heart that the muscle also attaches to. And um, we have basically two sets of valves. So we have atrioventricular valves, which sit between the atria and the ventricles. And there's one on either side. So this one is the left side of the heart. It's called the bicuspid or mitral valve. Bicuspid because it has two flaps to it, as opposed to the tricuspid, which has three over here on the right side of the heart. Um, it, this one over here, the bicuspid, is also called the mitral valve because um, it kind of looks like a little dome. And when people were naming it, they thought it looked like the Pope's hat, which is called a miter. Stories behind naming these things can be really ridiculous. Um, and then the other pair of valves are called semilunar valves because somebody thought that these little flaps looked like um, half moons. And um, there's one for each of the blood vessels that receives blood when the ventricles pump. So the aortic valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. And the pulmonary valve is between the pulmonary trunk and the right ventricle. So the way it basically works is that when a valve is open, blood can flow through. That means the blood is going in the right direction. So what we're seeing here is the atrioventricular valve open on the left side of the heart. So blood is coming into the left atrium so the receiving chamber through the AV valve into the left ventricle, which is the pumping chamber. And um, this aortic valve is closed to prevent blood from going back in the wrong direction. Now, when the ventricle pumps, 
it's going to squeeze blood in order to send it out the vessel, so out the aorta. And in order to make sure that blood doesn't go back the other way, this valve closes and blocks the flow. And it does it because it's literally set up so that the blood flowing this direction gets caught in these little cusps and it slams it shut. And the same thing happens here. Once this is done pumping blood, this valve is going to shut because if blood tries to flow back, it catches these little flaps and that actually keeps it shut. So they're designed to be passive. There's no active process to make these valves open and close. It's just based on um, the way that the blood moves against these uh, flaps. All right, so let's take a look at the flow of the blood and look at these parts again, because I didn't quite flesh them out properly before. Okay, so I said it's a double pump. So the right side of the heart is called the pulmonary circuit, again, because it takes blood that doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it, and it sends it to the lungs to get more oxygen. This blood is coming from the body, having just given all the tissues in the body its nutrients, including the oxygen. Once that blood gets oxygenated, it's going to re-enter the left side of the heart, and that'll be the systemic circuit, which then pumps this oxygen-rich blood through the rest of the body. Um, there is a little side chute off of the systemic circuit that supplies the heart with blood. This is called coronary circulation. So the heart itself has blood vessels in it because it's so thick that it cannot get enough nutrition from the blood inside of the chambers. Um, now, as we keep talking about the movement of blood, and we haven't actually learned about blood vessels yet, it's important to note that when we call something an artery, it means that it is a blood vessel carrying blood away from the heart. Now, most of the time that blood is also oxygenated, but in the pulmonary circuit, it's not because those arteries are taking the blood to the lungs to get oxygenated. Veins are blood vessels carrying blood back to the heart, and usually they are carrying deoxygenated blood from the body, but in the pulmonary circuit, they are carrying oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart. And hopefully as I go through this, it'll be clear why I make that distinction. Um, another thing to point out about uh, arteries versus veins, so if you can see your veins through your skin, they look like they're blue. And that may make you think that the blood in them is blue, unless you've you know, had enough blood drawn. But it's actually not. It's just a darker red than the oxygenated blood, which we really can't ever see through our skin because our arteries are deeper than our veins. Um, and so we never really see them um, from the outside. The reason why it actually looks blue is because the connective tissue surrounding the veins um, reflects the light in such a way that it looks blue instead. So these are, this is um, a picture of a couple of syringes of arterial or oxygenated blood on one side, and then the deoxygenated venous blood on the other. And the reason why it's still red is because it's not actually out of oxygen. It just doesn't have enough to supply the tissues anymore. So that's one I like to make sure everybody's clear on because it is um, a misconception because, I mean, it, we look, if you can see them, they look like they're blue. And the veins are blue, but the blood inside of them is not. Okay, so again, these circuits. So the right side of the heart, we have the right atrium, blood comes from the body, goes through the, uh, the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and then it gets pumped out to the lungs through the pulmonary valve. 
oxygenated blood then returns to the left side of the heart um, into the left atrium. And then it goes through the bicuspid or left AV valve into the left ventricle. And then it gets pumped to the rest of the body by way of the aorta through the aortic valve. And that's kind of the big parts of the anatomy that we need to know. Um, there are a couple of other things that I probably forgot to tell you, but we'll tackle them as we, as we come to them if they're relevant. Okay, so again, right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the body, sends it through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which then pumps that blood to the lungs for oxygen um, through the pulmonary valve, um, and then the pulmonary trunk sends it to each lung. The oxygenated blood comes back into the left side of the heart by the left atrium, goes through the left um, AV valve or mitral or bicuspid, has too many names, into the left ventricle, which then pumps it out to the body through the aortic valve and the aorta. The blood then goes through the whole body, giving oxygen and other nutrients to all the tissues, and then it returns to the right side of the heart um, by way of the superior and inferior vena cava. So that's our basic uh, double circuit. Um, although you don't need to know the specific blood vessels of the coronary circuits, uh, these um, are basically what they look like. They come off of the aorta before it does anything else, and they encircle kind of the, the midline of the heart um, kind of right where the valves are, and then they branch off and eventually dive into the heart and supply it with blood. Um, this is the back side. The deoxygenated blood returns to the right side of the heart along with everything else because there are veins that drain the heart too. So that's the coronary circulation because the heart is thick enough that it needs its own blood vessels. These are also the ones that get clogged um, and can cause a heart attack because if they get clogged, now this muscle that's working very hard all the time is not getting enough oxygenated blood and it can be damaged or it can die. And that's essentially um, one way to get a heart attack. All right, does anybody have any questions on the anatomy? Um, you pretty much just need to know the chambers, the valves, and the flow of blood, and then the blood vessels. All right, good. Um, give me one second to check on something, and then I'll be right back. 
sorry, stuff going on. Um, chambers, valves, flow of blood, and the blood vessels that the blood flows out of. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is cardiac muscle, which um, we have actually talked about a bit already. So we don't need to do very much. Um, and we're just kind of going to compare it to what we've already learned about skeletal muscle. So remember that we have three types of muscle tissue, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Now cardiac muscle fibers are striated. And now you know that striated means that they have myofibrils and therefore sarcomeres, okay? Um, but unlike skeletal muscle, they're uh, single nuclei only. Um, they are branched and they are electrically connected. So the intercalated discs have gap junctions to electrically connect them, as well as desmosomes, so that when these cells are contracting, they're not uh, tearing apart from each other. This electrical connection means that all of the cardiac muscle behaves as one single unit, okay? So remember the appearance of the cardiac muscle fibers with these intercalated discs and the branching. Um, there are a couple of differences between the way that skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle work. And one of the big ones is that some of the calcium that needs to go into um, the sarcoplasm to uh, allow the contraction cycle to occur. So in order to have um, the, oof, sorry. So in order to have cross bridge formation, Right, we need calcium. So some of this calcium is actually coming in from the extracellular fluid, not just coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, so that's kind of a big difference. And it's significant because it means that the um, extracellular calcium levels can have an effect on the way the heart functions. So uh, this is the cardiomyocyte or heart muscle cell contraction cycle. It works very much the same way. And we'll talk about the um, cardiac equivalent of the neuromuscular junction in a minute because that's the biggest difference. Um, this stuff is pretty much exactly the same and um, you don't need to know any of the details here um, because it looks nearly identical, okay? So we're doing the cross bridge thing, we're using ATP, we have a power stroke, um, we're moving them to the center, all of that stuff is the same. The differences are in how they get triggered, and then as we'll see, there are actually a couple of differences in the action potentials. So the major difference here is that there are specialized cardiomyocytes, so specialized uh, heart muscle fibers that trigger the heart to pump. So there's two types of cells within cardiac muscle fibers. The vast majority are the contractile cells. So they're the ones that actually contract and do the job and, um, you know, pump blood in the heart. But there are some that are called conducting cells. And they are arranged in an organized fashion throughout the heart to form a conduction system. And they have a quality called autorhythmacy. So autorhythmic cells will spontaneously depolarize and send electrical impulses to whatever they're in contact with. So autorhythmacy means spontaneous, depolarization. So we call this whole thing an intrinsic conduction system. 
So intrinsic meaning internal to the structure of the heart um, and conduction, just like a train conductor is controlling a train, this system of specialized uh, cells is controlling the pace of the heart itself. So because they are connected to all of the contractile cells by those gap junctions and making them a functional syncytium, when these guys spontaneously depolarize, it makes the entirety of the heart depolarize and therefore contract. So the ones setting the rhythm are called the pacemaker cells. And the way that they do it is that they have an unstable resting membrane potential. So instead of being able to stay at resting unless stimulated, these guys are actually constantly slowly depolarizing. And um, the, uh, the rhythm at which they spontaneously depolarize is called pacemaker potential um, or prepotentials, but I usually use pacemaker potentials because it, it's more descriptive. Every time they reach threshold and actually have an electrical impulse, they are initiating action potentials that then spread throughout the heart. So the conduction system is set up like this. Um, give me one second. Yep, okay. So there's a sinoatrial node here um, in like uh, the right atrium, and it's connected by some fibers to all of the atrial muscle. And then this atrioventricular node is the only electrical connection between the atrial muscle and the ventricular muscle. This is because all of that connective tissue skeleton where the valves sit and the muscle is connected actually prevents a connection. So that functional syncytium that we've talked about, there's a separate one for the atria and a separate one for the ventricles. So this AV node is the only connection between them. And then it's got um, an AV bundle that sends it down to this septum, which divides up the left and right side. Uh, that branches into what we call bundle branches. And then it rounds the corner and goes up the outside walls as these things called Purkinje fibers. So the sinoatrial node is the pacemaker of the heart. As in, in a healthy heart, this is the guy that's spontaneously depolarizing and actually setting the pace of our heartbeats. When it does depolarize, it spreads that um, action potential through both of the atria pretty much simultaneously via internodal pathways. That's what we call those little lines spreading out to each atrium. Sorry. So what this is showing you is the sinoatrial node depolarizing and spreading its signal. And once it spreads it to all of the atrial um, muscle cells, and they're of course spreading it amongst themselves too, then all of that muscle contracts. And so that's what this is showing is the atria are contracting here. Um, the next part of the system is that atrioventricular node because it literally sits between the atria and the ventricles. And it's actually kind of slow. So when it receives an electrical signal from the SA node, it takes it a minute, not actually a minute, but it takes it a few milliseconds to actually um, continue to spread the signal. And that's actually on purpose. That's because we need the atria to contract before the ventricles contract. Because when the atria contract, they send the last bit of blood into the ventricles to fill them so that when they contract, they're able to send an appropriate amount of blood out of the heart. So if they all contract at the same time, that wouldn't work very well. So instead we have this delay built into the system so that the atria contract first and then the ventricles contract. Now in order to get all of the ventricular muscles to um, depolarize and contract. We're going to spread it down this atrioventricular bundle and the left and right bundle branches. So that's traveling through the interventricular septum, which is the shared wall that divides the left and right 
um, ventricles. And that's going to take us to what's called the apex of the heart, or that pointy bit at the bottom. And then we go up to the, the outside walls of the left and right ventricle by these Purkinje fibers, which are actually quite fast. Um, <clears throat> because uh, of the way that the signal travels, we tend to have contraction starting at the apex of the ventricles and moving upwards, which is good because the valves are up here. So we're literally squeezing blood from the base out kind of like you would squeeze toothpaste um, from the, the back end like you're supposed to so that all the blood actually goes the right direction or toothpaste, whichever. So here we have a V valve depolarizing down the bundle, bundle branches, down the septum to the apex, and then up the left and right side by the Purkinje fibers. So we contract from here upwards and that'll send the blood um, out to the lungs from the right side and the body from the left side. Okay, so here it all is again. So again, um, SA node depolarizes first. All these <clears throat> interatrial pathways uh, or internodal pathways spreading the signal to both of the atria so that they contract. When they contract, they send blood through the AV valves into the ventricles. And then the AV node finally fires uh, down the bundle. And then that divides into a left and right uh, bundle branch in the interventricular septum, dividing up the ventricles. And then the Purkinje fibers send them this way. So then the ventricles start to contract and they squeeze the blood up and out, and the blood exits the semilunar valves and into these giant arteries. So the pulmonary trunk to the lungs, the aorta to the rest of the body. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like when you take everything else out. I just think that's cool. Um, so the details of how these pacemaker cells actually spontaneously depolarize. So they do it because they have sodium leak channels. So that's weird and different. Um, other cells don't typically have that. And remember that when sodium enters a cell, it makes it less negative and a little more positive. And so as the sodium is leaking in, we're slowly making the cell less negative until it reaches threshold. Once it reaches threshold, it's going to have an action potential. Um, but it happens a little bit differently than it would in a skeletal muscle cell or a neuron. So because we're slowly leaking sodium and depolarizing the threshold, when we hit threshold, we actually activate voltage-gated calcium channels rather than voltage-gated sodium channels. So calcium comes in. And then, just like any other electrically active cell, we open some slow potassium channels, we repolarize, and then we slowly leak our way back to threshold. So this is, this is just the words that go along with depolarizing, right? So voltage-gated calcium channels, calcium entering the cell. Um, and then the calcium channels close, and then repolarizing with the potassium channels. Now we say resting, but because it's not actually staying there, I had it in little quotation marks because it's like resting membrane potential. Because again, they're just gonna immediately start slowly depolarizing again. So again, we call this pacemaker potential because it's setting the pace of heartbeats. And only a couple of parts of the um, intrinsic conduction system are actually pacemaker cells. So SA node cells, sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, and then Purkinje cells. So the rest of it, the internodal paths and the bundle and the bundle branches, they don't do this. They just transmit it like electrical wires. 
Now the rate of spontaneous depolarization differs between the sites. Um, and the rule is that whoever depolarizes first spreads the signal and depolarizes everybody. So the fastest one sets the actual pace and in a healthy heart, that is going to be the sinoatrial node. So because the sinoatrial node is the fastest to spontaneously depolarize, it sets the pace. The only time that these other guys ever actually get to de spontaneously depolarize the threshold is if the SA node is sick. And in that case, they will take over, but they're slower, so then your heart won't beat quite as fast as it should. Um, this is just comparing this spontaneously depolarizing action potential to the one that we've already learned about that other cells do when they have a stable resting membrane potential. All right, so that is just the conducting cells. Now the contractile cells are different. So the contractile cells are like skeletal muscle and most neurons where they have a stable resting membrane potential. And so they also require an external stimulus in order to depolarize. The difference is that they're going to be depolarizing because the contractile, uh, the conducting cells depolarized rather than because a neuron told them to or something else. And the other thing is that, of course, now we don't have chemical synapses between everything. We just have these gap junctions electrically connecting everything. Now, when we have gap junctions, um, we're simply going to trigger the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels and cause rapid depolarization. So the initiation of an action potential in a contractile cell is much more like neurons and skeletal muscle than our conducting ones where that, that part is, is because of calcium. But calcium still plays a really important role in the contractile cell action potential because they have something that nobody else does. They have a plateau phase. So they, they hit threshold and they spontaneously depolar, or, and, they, and they go through their action potential. Sorry, it's not spontaneous. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so this is sodium channels. But then we have voltage-gated calcium channels again. Now these guys are slow, so they didn't open right away but they open and it maintains a steady depolarized state for a little bit of time. And in the meantime, those potassium channels that usually repolarize open, um, but they do it kind of slowly. And so the calcium channels letting calcium in and the potassium channels letting potassium out maintains this plateau or this flat, area at the depolarized state. And then the calcium channels close, and so the potassium out actually repolarizes the cell. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> now, just like neurons and skeletal muscle, these contractile cells have a refractory period, a period of time when they are unable to respond to depolarization. Cardiac cells have a very long refractory period compared to neurons and skeletal muscle. So whereas with skeletal muscle, if we keep stimulating, we can get uh, an increase in tension where they don't relax anymore, but that doesn't work in hearts. So the refractory period is long enough that the heart muscle contractile cells always relax before they can be stimulated to contract again. And that's very deliberate because your heart cannot pump if it doesn't relax to refill between pumps. If it just stayed contracted, you would just, you would die because then you wouldn't be able to refill and that kind of shuts the whole pumping action down. So this is what the action potential of a contractile cell looks like. It's very different from any other type of cell. So we're hitting threshold because of the um, conducting cells, 
we're opening the voltage gated ion channels, sodium causing rapid depolarization, sodium channels close, calcium channels open, and <clears throat> the potassium channels are gonna open somewhere in here as well, and that maintains this plateau. Then the calcium channel, or yeah, the calcium channels close, potassium stays open, and so then we repolarize. The absolute refractory period is up to halfway through um, the repolarization. The relative is right here. So under normal circumstances, we fully repolarize before we can initiate another action potential. So why? So I, I mentioned already, like, we don't want to get any sort of summation or tetany in cardiac muscle, because that would be bad. But the other thing is that these guys are kind of slow. So remember that period of time to generate tension in skeletal muscle and how we have the fast twitch ones and the slow twitch ones? Cardiac muscle is pretty slow twitch. So in order to actually generate adequate tension, it needs most of the time that the cell is in its action potential. So the plateau is what's necessary to let these cardiac muscle cells contract up to actually pump and then relax again. So you can see that's a pretty big delay between the initiation of depolarization and the actual achieving of a useful amount of tension. Um, and then this is another one that I pulled off of the internet that is nice because it actually um, talks about the different channels opening and which direction the ions are going um, to help you remember what's going on there. There's a little more information than you need, so if it's not something I talked about in the previous ones, don't worry about it, um, but I like that it's got the ion movement. Okay, so um, the metabolism of these cells is um, even better than our slow oxidative. So you can think of cardiac myocytes as like the extreme of our slow oxidative fibers. So <clears throat> they're entirely aerobic. They have a ton of mitochondria, a ton of myoglobin, um, very, very vascular tissue and they're able to use glucose and fatty acids for fuel. And additionally, they can actually use the lactose that skeletal muscle generates as a waste product during anaerobic metabolism. They can use it because they always have oxygen present and they can run it through their aerobic uh, metabolic processes. Now this is important because it means that you cannot deprive heart muscle of oxygen any more than you can deprive neurons of oxygen. They're very metabolically active and they need to be aerobic because they're using so much ATP and they never get to rest, right? Like they never get a break. They just like sometimes get to pump a little slower, but they're always pumping, right? They can't stop. Does anybody have any questions before we get into the cardiac cycle? Okay, so we're gonna look at the flow of blood run more time, but now we're gonna look at it in regards to the blood pressure being generated as the heart pumps. So the cardiac cycle is everything that happens um, when the heart beats. So within one beat, it's all of the electrical events that we just talked about, it's all of the mechanical events of actual contraction and squeezing on blood and stuff and blood flowing, which we divide into two parts. So systole is when contraction is occurring and there's atrial systole when they contract and then there's ventricular systole when the ventricles contract. And then diastole is when they are relaxing. So again, there's diastole of the atria when they relax and fill with blood again and diastole of the ventricles as they relax and fill with blood. 
So remember that the heart valves open and close based on pressure within the heart. And the entire cardiac cycle is just a repetitive cycle of pressure and volume changes in the heart of this blood that's flowing through. So again, we're gonna start at the same spot and work our way through. So we start in diastole when all four chambers are relaxed and filling with blood in preparation for the next cycle. This is the part where we're slowly, spontaneously depolarizing with our pacemaker cells. And the next part of the cycle starts when they depolarize the threshold and have an action potential and spread it to the contractile cells. So the first thing that's going to happen as this action potential spreads from the sinoatrial node out through the atria is we're going to get atrial systole or atrial contraction. So as the atria contract, it's going to squeeze the chamber, the lumen of each atrium, which is full of blood, and it's going to push that blood into the ventricles. So the right atrium squeezes blood into the right ventricle. The left atrium squeezes blood into the left ventricle. Um, don't worry about that. I meant to take that out. We are not going to talk about an EKG because I needed to cut some stuff out. I just don't have time. Okay, don't worry about that part. Okay, so we start here. SA node fires, spreads, contraction of the atria, aka atrial systole. Then, of course, the AV node is going to finally send that signal down the bundles and up the Purkinje fibers, and that's when we're going to get ventricular contraction and ventricular systole. So now the ventricles are contracting. They are full of blood because they've been filling the entire time that the chambers were relaxed and they get topped up when the atria contract. And the first thing that happens is they start to contract. The blood gets squeezed and it pushes back against these atrioventricular valves and that slams them shut so that we're not getting any backflow of blood into the atria. The amount of blood in the ventricles when they start to contract is called the end diastolic volume or preload, and this will be relevant later. So I'll bring it up again. You'll be like, oh yeah, you mentioned that before. Now the semilunar valves are already shut because they are shut throughout the entirety of diastole. And that's because there's still pressure in the blood in those vessels, and we don't want any backflow into the heart ever. So the pressure in the blood inside the aorta and the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary arteries is keeping those guys shut. Because remember, the blood just kind of like actually sits in there and holds these valves shut. So we now have all four valves shut as the ventricles are squeezing and they're building up pressure, but they're not changing the volume inside of the chambers yet because it's completely closed. And it's gonna stay that way until the ventricle pressure is greater than the pressure in these arteries because that's when we're gonna be able to open these valves, these semilunar valves and send blood through. So that gives us two parts to ventricular systole. Isovolumetric contraction is when all of the valves are closed and we're building up pressure, but we're not moving any blood. Ventricular ejection is the point at which the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in those arteries, and we open the valves and we move blood through. The amount of blood that exits the ventricle during ventricular systole is called stroke volume. So where one pump of the heart is one stroke, this is stroke volume. 
Now, not all the blood leaves. We never empty the chambers. Some of the blood always stays in there because what would happen, like there's nothing else to replace it. So you're never gonna fully empty the heart as long as you're alive and it's connected. So the amount of blood that's left in the ventricles is called the end systolic volume. And the stroke volume is actually the end diastolic volume. So what you start with when the heart ventricles are contracting minus the end systolic volume gets you the amount that actually left, right? So what you start with versus what you're left with, if you take the difference, you're gonna get what actually managed to get out of the heart. And again, no, don't worry, don't worry about that. So after we've successfully ejected some blood from the ventricles, we're gonna be done with that electrical activity. The ventricular muscle is going to relax. As soon as we are done ejecting blood and the muscle starts to relax, the pressure in those arteries becomes higher again. Well, it doesn't change, but it's now higher than the ventricles as the ventricles ease off the pressure and that shuts the semilunar valves. Um, now, the, uh, the atrioventricular valves have been closed since the beginning of ventricular systole. So now again, we have this period of time where all four valves are shut as the ventricles relax. So we call this isovolumetric relaxation. It's the first part of ventric uh, ventricular diastole. And then once the pressure drops below the pressure in the atria, in the left and right atrium, the AV valves open and that allows blood to start flowing from the atria into the ventricles again and slowly filling the ventricles. So, sorry, don't mind that. Okay, so the ventricles have two parts to their systole. Um, atrial diastole is happening from the end of systole all the way through here. It's quite long. Um, ventricular diastole though starts here and runs to here and it's in two parts. Isovolumetric relaxation and ventricular filling. Now the keys to this entire cycle are that the blood flow, the actual movement of blood, is entirely controlled by the pressure changes. So that's what the heart muscle does when it contracts and relaxes is it changes the pressure of the blood. Blood is always gonna flow down its pressure gradient through any available opening, which is why the valves make sure that the flow is one way. So, um, so fluids, including blood, always flow from high pressure to low pressure, always, because it's a passive process. All right, does anybody have any questions about the cardiac cycle? Okay, so um, one more thing about this um, is that as the blood is moving through the chambers, um, it actually creates these sounds that we can hear. Um, you can hear these sounds if you put your ear up against somebody's chest, but usually that's a little invasive, um, and so we use a stethoscope. So listening to the heart with a stethoscope is called cardiac auscultation. And we describe the sounds as a lub, a dub, and then a pause. Now, we um, used to think that they were caused by the valves closing, but now we know that it's actually caused by turbulent blood flow as the blood hits the closed valves. So a slightly different thing. Um, but they're still related to the valves opening and closing, and so we can use these sounds to know what the heart is doing. 
so the one that we typically hear as a love is um, closure of the atrial ventricular valves, which means that it marks the beginning of ventricular systole. Um, the lub is typically a louder, longer, and more resonant noise, as in it like seems like it carries for more time. And then the dub is caused by the turbulence when the semilunar valves close. And of course, that is the beginning of ventricular diastole. This is typically a, a shorter, sharper sound, and so they are distinct from each other. And then there's a pause before the next paired set of lub dubs. So every time you hear lub dub, that is a single heartbeat. It is a single cardiac cycle. So this is actually a chart showing you the valve openings and closings and the pressure changes in the different chambers as they correspond to the heart sounds. So we're in um, we're in ventricular diastole here, and then um, this little bump right here that's atrial systole. And then as the ventricles start to contract, it closes the AV valves that causes blood to um, kind of, you know, uh, bounce off of them. And that causes this first sound. Now we're in the isovolumetric contraction and we build the ventricular pressure until it exceeds that in the artery beyond. This is just, by the way, the left side of the heart. So now this is a ventricular ejection as we actually move blood. And then we are going to start having ventricular relaxation. And so once this pressure drops, we close the semilunar valves again, and that gives us our second part noise. So then this part is isovolumetric relaxation until the pressure drops below that in the atrium. And then the AV valves open and we have ventricular filling. Then we have um, atrial systole again, and we start over. So everything in the heart follows this cyclic uh, pathway over and over and over again. And so we can just keep building layers and layers of what's happening in the heart as we see these different things. Um, this is just kind of showing how you can sort of hear more of each valve with different places. You don't really need to know this at all, um, but it's the only picture I have for it. So um, valves aren't 100%, they are capable of failing. So um, as kind of a trying to tie this in to you know, health and stuff, um, what, what happens when we have a valve leaking? Like the bicuspid valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, um, and the blood is actually able to flow backwards. So this is gonna cause a couple of different problems. Um, one of them is that now we're putting too much blood back in the atria, um, which is gonna cause it to stretch. The other problem is that now not as much blood is gonna successfully leave the left side of the heart through the aorta and go in the direction it's supposed to. Um, and so then the body has to deal with the fact that it's not quite getting as much blood as it's supposed to and um, this is how we end up with the heart then responding to these issues by trying to work harder to supply the body with blood. And as we'll talk about on Wednesday, this is also um, where the body responds by trying to keep your blood pressure up to keep all your tissues um, taken care of. And eventually what happens is that the heart starts to fail because it just can't quite compensate for this leak in the system. So that's kind of the short version of that. 
um, heart.org uh, has a ton of really good uh, videos and other um, resources. So if you're curious about any of this or if you have a personal reason to be interested in any of this, um, I highly recommend those resources. So you can watch that one if you want to see. Um, this one is aortic valve regurgitation rather than bicuspid, but um, similar problems. Um, you don't need to know this, but another way that we can get things like leaks in the heart um, is because the heart doesn't always form correctly. So this is uh, just showing you some examples of congenital defects where we end up with extra holes that shouldn't be there, and that can cause problems too and will require oftentimes a surgery to correct them. Um, these are again from, from the heart.org. Um, if you're curious about listening to hearts, here are some resources on cardiac auscultation. Um, again, totally fine if you don't want to use any of them, just in case. So the last thing that we want to talk about, and we'll finish it up on Wednesday, is uh, the, the overall physiology. So everything though thus far has been, you know, there was a lot of physiology there, but we also want to look at how we regulate this. So how do we change heartbeat? How do we how do we, you know, when the body needs more or less blood, like how do we actually influence this? And so that's the, where we get into like the homeostasis of the heart. Um, so first thing to understand when we talk about this type of homeostasis is cardiac output. So cardiac output is defined as the volume of blood pumped by each ventricle per minute. Um, now each ventricle should be moving the same amount of blood because th even though we have two separate circuits, they are connected to each other, right? Um, and so we should always have the same cardiac output on each side. Uh, the way that we work that out is that cardiac output is equal to the stroke volume, so the amount of blood pumped per cardiac cycle times the heart rate, which is the number of times the heart is pumping per minute. So when we look at how to regulate cardiac output or how much blood is being delivered to our bodies at any given time, um, we see that it's a matter of manipulating heart rate and stroke volume. So remember that stroke volume, I, I pointed out to you before, is going to be how much blood comes out of the heart, and it's the difference between um, the end diastolic volume, so how much blood is in the ventricles right as it hits systole, and then the end systolic volume, or how much is remaining. Now, um, the end diastolic volume is mostly a function of how long the ventricle is relaxed and able to fill, so the length of ventricular diastole. The other thing that determines it is venous pressure. So we haven't talked about veins yet, but I did tell you that they are returning blood to the heart, and um, blood in blood vessels as well as in the heart always flows down its pressure gradient. So venous pressure is also going to determine how much blood is able to flow back into the ventricles from the veins. Now the end systolic volume is determined by the arterial blood pressure because this is what the ventricle has to overcome to open those semilunar valves and get the blood out. And then the force of ventricular contraction because that is the ventricle overcoming that pressure. So because cardiac output is determined by stroke volume and heart rate, changes in either stroke volume or heart rate will change cardiac output. Now cardiac output is um, highly variable because a lot of different situations will change how much oxygen different tissues in the body need. So the, body, the heart needs to be able to respond fairly rapidly to changing conditions in order to properly supply all of your tissues. Uh, cardiac reserve is how much extra cardiac output you have to call upon compared to when you're at rest. So the difference between your resting cardiac output and your maximum cardiac output. 
in order to call upon your cardiac reserve in times of high oxygen demand. Um, your body is going to regulate your stroke volume and your heart rate to manipulate your cardiac output. So we have a flow chart showing how we're able to change these different things. So the things that affect um, heart rate are nervous system innervation, hormones, your fitness level, and your age. And we'll we'll touch on these guys. Basically, your uh, heart rate changes with age. We don't really get into it. Um, and then there's a variety of things that affect stroke volume. So the size of your heart, uh, your fitness level, the fitter your heart, the better your stroke volume often is. Um, your gender, um, in part because this affects heart size because men are typically on average larger than women, their hearts are gonna be two. Um, uh, contractility, which is how strongly the heart muscle can contract. Uh, duration of contraction, so how long systole is. That preload that we've already talked about. And then there, the afterload, which is the basically the resistance or the blood pressure in those arteries. So we're gonna hit the three big factors that actually play a role in affecting stroke volume in an individual, because some of this stuff we can't change, right? Your heart size, um, your gender, you're kind of stuck with that. Um, your fitness level can be changed over time, but not in you know a minute to minute situation. So when we look at what we can actually change, um, we're gonna be looking at um, contractility, uh, preload and afterload. Duration of contraction is actually a link between heart rate and stroke volume because um, your heart rate is going to determine how um, how long you can stay contracted, mostly. So um, preload or end diastolic volume is basically how much volume is in your ventricles before they contract but it also is going to determine how stretched your cardiocytes are before they contract. So um, let's see. So we talked about um, the optimal resting length in skeletal muscle and how if skeletal muscle is too stretched out or too contracted, then it's harder for it to generate maximum force. And cardiomyocytes are the same way, but usually they're not particularly stretched out. So they're actually less than their optimum resting length. But if we stretch them more, then they get closer to that and they're able to get a more contraction. So as we increase the preload and stretch these cardiocytes more, we're going to get um, more of a contraction. And that's going to get us a higher stroke volume. So we're actually going to eject more blood when, um, from the ventricle if more blood has been put in. So anything that affects the end diastolic volume is going to increase cardiac output. And again, remember that's how long we're in diastole and the pressure of um, the venous system. Ah, here it is. Ha, ha. Um, okay, so the length tension relationship in cardiac muscle um, is similar to but different from skeletal muscle. So usually it is below its optimal length, like I said. So when we stretch it by adding more end diastolic volume, we're actually getting it closer to its optimum length and therefore closer to its maximum contractile ability. Now the name for the length tension relationship in cardiac muscle is called Starling Law of the Heart or the Frank Starling Mechanism because some guy named Starling worked it out and some guy named Frank. Last name I assume. Can't remember off the top of my head. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> okay so basically um, more end diastolic volume causes more stroke volume, which causes more cardiac output.
The second factor is contractility. So contractility is how strongly the heart muscle can contract at a given preload. So this is actually separate from the length tension relationship. Um, this is a matter of changing how strongly it can contract at a given stretch level. And this is determined by the amount of calcium available to enter the cells. So remember that you know this is a situation where unlike skeletal muscles, some of the calcium is coming from outside, but calcium is necessary for cross bridges. So if we increase the amount of calcium in the sarcoplasm, we will increase the number of cross bridges that can form until we get to the point where we're at maximum cross bridge formation. So um, naturally, this occurs with increased sympathetic tone, so more sympathetic nervous system stimulation, more sympathetic hormone stimulation, so norepinephrine and epinephrine are going to lead to more calcium in the cell and therefore a higher strength of contraction, so more contractility. Um, we have drugs that can do this as well. Drugs that can do this are called uh, inotropes. I should have just taken that out. Oh well, it's too late. The last thing that can affect stroke volume is the afterload. So afterload is the other term we use for um, the arterial pressure that the ventricles are um, working against. So the higher the pressure in the arteries, the longer the ventricle spends in that isovolumetric contraction, and the less period of time or the shorter period of time it has in ventricular ejection. So less time in ventricular ejection means literally less time to eject blood, which is going to cause a smaller stroke volume. If the pressure is lower, then it decreases the amount of time in isovolumetric, increases the amount of time in ejection, and we increase the stroke volume. Now, if your blood pressure is relatively constant, if, which is usual if you're healthy, this isn't gonna be a big change. But in people with various blood pressure problems, this can cause issues. So this is, for example, one of the major reasons why having hypertension is a problem. Because if you constantly have this high blood pressure, your heart cannot deliver as much blood per stroke, um, and that's going to make it less efficient. So it's working harder for less gain, um, and that's going to eventually cause problems. Okay, so that's all of our factors affecting stroke volume that are actually changeable. Um, we'll pick up on Wednesday with factors affecting heart rate, and then we'll talk about blood vessels, and we'll talk about blood. Anybody have any questions before we're done? No? Okay. Oops. All right, so then I will...